but, but as I kind of went down that line, I was like, well, but then what would I do? <laughs> you know? Like, I, I think you, you need that mental stimulation and you need problems to solve. And so I focused less on. Hey everyone, Joe Moffa here with Master Life by Design. I'm excited for this interview today in the Millionaire Series. I have Brian Glass, and so we are excited to have him on the show. We're going to, he's going to bring a different twist as a business owner and just a few steps ahead in the passive income game. So we're going to dive into all of that. But Brian, thank you for being here. I appreciate you and welcome. Hey brother, I'm, I'm really happy to be here and excited to get into it with you today. Awesome. Well, as always, I always like to get a little bit of a background so our audience understands who you are, where you came from, and kind of where you are and where you're looking to go. So if you could just take a couple of minutes, share with us, how did you get to where you are today? Just get us caught up to speed, and then we'll dive in. Yeah, so thanks, Joe. So I'm, I'm an auto accident lawyer uh, in Northern Virginia, Fairfax, Virginia, about 20 minutes outside of D.C., uh, and I run a small auto practice here. We have five lawyers and it's my dad and I who are partners. So I'm the oldest of nine kids. Um, my, I have four biological siblings. And then when my youngest brother, uh, my youngest brother was born when I was like a junior or sophomore in high school. And then my parents went and adopted four kids from China. So that's, that's kind of how I was raised really in a two generation almost uh, household with like what we call the big kids, my four uh, brothers and sisters who are a little bit older. And then the the new generation that we didn't really grow up with, except seeing coming back from college. So that was kind of cool. Uh, I went to school at, at James Madison University in Virginia, and then uh, went out, spent one year at Michigan State University, my first year of law school, transferred to William & Mary, and graduated law school in 2008, which was like the worst time in the last three decades, except for right now, to be graduating from law school because it was the credit market crash. All of the, the quote, big law jobs disappeared. And, you know, all of us who had gone to school with the promise of making $160,000 your first year out of law school <laughs> were left without jobs, especially if you were like me and you weren't exactly in the top 10, 15% of the class. So my first job out of law school, I, I was making $60,000 a year at a general practice firm. And I lasted there about four months because um, I had no training, no supervision. Joe, I, I got sworn in in Richmond on a Tuesday and they sent me to court by myself the next day to defend somebody on a misdemeanor charge. And I like, what am I? <laughs> no training at all. So I lasted wow. there four months uh, before I left to go join an auto accident injury practice. And if you're not familiar in that world, we're paid entirely on contingency fee, meaning I only make money if I win your case for you. And if I win your case for you, I keep a third of whatever the case settles for or whatever we get at trial. And so the game for auto accident lawyers is to maximize the size of the case that's coming in and and as best you can minimize the amount of time and effort that you have to spend on them, right? That's the way to increase your effective hourly rate. And so for the last 15 years, I've been focusing on exactly that. How do we bring in the biggest and the best cases? How do we have a, a fantastic system that runs through them as fast as we can? And then how do we push down you know, to the lowest common denominator, all of the tasks that can be outsourced either to paralegals or to legal assistants or to people who are overseas. So we have a team that's in Honduras and in the Philippines that handles a lot of our lower level tasks. Uh, and it's great arbitrage for us because they're cheaper than any U.S. based people. And it's great for them because it's more money working. They're making more money working for us than they would, you know, working for anybody over there. Uh, so that's been the game over the last 15 years. Um, I was I was the first decade of my career competing with my dad, really, who's also a lawyer in Northern Virginia for auto accident cases. And then I joined his practice in 2019 after I'd spent, you know, the decade making my own name, reputation, friends, and way of doing things. So that's, that's kind of the practice in a nutshell. He and I run the law firm now. Like I said, we have five lawyers. We have a second business. It's a mastermind business where we coach lawyers from across the country about how to operate you know, practices that you can step away from, that you can take a vacation from without your cell phone and without your email. And we've got about 200 members in that organization. Wow. You know, that's so impressive because for all the small business owners that are watching right now, um, a lot of them more than likely don't have the ability to take a week, two weeks, three weeks vacation in a year because they are the business. They're running it like without them, it falls apart. 
And so for you to be able to come in and show them and optimize their systems, their strategies, their thought process around it, that's huge. That's really huge. So um, is it just limited to lawyers or is it small business? Only lawyers. So we, we are for solo and small law firms. You know, we describe it as you have to have less than two other partners because you've got to have decision-making authority. And our sweet spot really is people who are doing somewhere between a half million dollars in revenue per year and $5 million in revenue per year. Once you get past five, you're in the big TV market stuff. That That's really not our um, it's not our wheelhouse, but if you're from 500,000 to about 5 million, we can help you double your revenue and take more money home. That's amazing. So, Hey, if you know any lawyers and you're watching this and they're around that place, he's the man to help. Uh, so, um, awesome. I love that. And I love that you also know your lane, like so many people out there, they don't, they try to jump into so many different lanes and uh, obviously that's not impactful. Uh, I also know you got a family. Tell us about your family. Yeah. So my wife, Krista, and I have been married for almost 14 years. We met when I was interning at a law firm in DC in law school. She was a legal assistant there. She didn't notice me the first time I worked there, but when I came back, <laughs> I came back the next summer, uh, we hit it off. We, we are the kind of people who are always the last people to leave happy hour. And so we just developed a relationship around that and then kind of dated long distance my last year of law school. Um, we have three young boys. They're 10, 8, and 5. So they're all uh, all now out of daycare, one step closer to financial freedom, as we were talking about before we got on. Yeah. Uh, and what I love about my practice is I, I make it a real commitment to be able to leave the office every day during sports season at 4 o'clock. And I've coached soccer. I've coached baseball you know, whatever I feel like I can help out with, with my kids, I'm, I'm happy to go and spend a little bit of time on YouTube, learning how to put together a practice and then try to run a practice. That's amazing. See, I love that, especially here at Master Life by Design, sounds like you're designing your life, right? The way you want it, instead of letting your business or in some cases, people watching their job dictate your life and what you do and when you do it. So I love that you kind of got the fat formula, but then again, that's why you have your mastermind to teach people how to do what you've done, right? Because it's hundred percent. You know, I know I've coached some attorneys, and um, their lifestyles are just 80, 90 hours a week, right? They may make great money, but they're trapped. And so, I love what you're doing to be able to help create that freedom for them and optimize what they're doing because a lot of them don't know. They know they know how to be a good lawyer. They don't know how to be a good business owner. And I think you're yeah. married too. No, that's the that's the big distinction, right? It's it's being able to run an actual business and not and it's it's great. You want to be a good lawyer and you want to stay in that lane and, and operate, that's fine, right? Master in master life by design. You can pick that life if that's the life you're picking. But so many of us go out and overcomplicate our lives by getting good at the next thing and the next thing and the, and the next thing and never offloading any of that to anybody else that could do it. And then we end up, you know, 15 years in with practices that we hate. And a family that never sees us. Yeah. And that is not like by design at all. So um, I have a question for you. You said she didn't notice you till you came back, but did you notice her before <laughs> you left? I I noticed her. We didn't, to be fair, it was winter time. We weren't going out to happy hour or anything. We and it was it was a larger firm and we'd only interacted a handful of times. But no, it the couple of times that I brought it up, oh, you, you know, you brought me a file once or twice. She's like, I don't remember doing that at all. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Well, hey, all that matters is you guys are together now. So the yeah. three awesome kids. Uh, so, all right. So let's jump in. Um, before we do it, it's something that I love doing just so the audience has an idea of the individual that's on the show. But um, net worth, roundabout ballpark figure, where would you say that your net worth is today? It depends on if you, if you count the, um, the value of the business. And, and I yeah. say that because law firms, especially small law firms, it, what they trade for is is really anybody's guess. So counting the value of the business about 5 million and without the value, the value of the business about two and a half. Beautiful. Absolutely. Businesses, I see businesses do count because if you can sell that, especially the way you guys have systematized yours, that absolutely factors in. I don't know what the multiples are, whether it's a 2X or 1.5 or four, you know, depending on how, where you are and whatnot. But um, very much I count that because it's you've put time to build that and you can sell it. So um, 
passive income. We've had people in here on the show that have had zero passive income. They're just starting their journey, but they're crushing it in business versus, uh, you know, people who are making a ton, 20, 50, 60 grand a month. Where are you guys in passive income in uh, just overall life? And then maybe even also your business. So, oh yeah, the business is, is interesting. So I'll come back to that, but just out, outside of the business passive is about 30 or 40,000. We have one Airbnb at the beach and I invest in syndications. Um, I, I figured out a couple of years ago that the better thing for me to do is not to go out and buy more real estate myself. But while I have this high, high income, figure out other places to place that money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pass, passive income from the business is an interesting question, you know, because it spits off profit in a K-1 on cases that I didn't work on, but it's really hard for me to quantify exactly what that looks like. It was, you know, business, it generated about a million dollars in profit last year, split between my dad and I. And of the stuff that I didn't work on, I probably didn't work on two thirds of that, right? So right. It, in that regard, it's a high number, I guess. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. And be, again, because the business owners that are watching it, I have one client of mine that they're, I'm going to have them watch a show, but being able to generate two thirds of your income from your business kind of passively, it's huge. It's powerful. And so everyone that's watching, I want you to know, it doesn't just have to be real estate. I know you own some, Brian, but um, there, if you have a business, the goal would be, how do you get yourself out of the business mm. or less working on, in it, excuse me, in it less time than you do, but still making the same, if not more money. That's the goal, right? I always tell people, uh, hey, business allows you to accelerate your income. Real estate is a long-term wealth generator. I don't, I don't see, like if you're just starting off for most people, I don't recommend going and buying real estate right away unless you're house hacking. Then it makes total sense, hmm. right? But to go cat, you know, put 150 grand down for a $200 a month cash flow doesn't make sense at all, right? Go take that 150 grand and pour it into your business so you can maximize your returns, right? And what you guys, you and your dad are doing. So, and then taking it and the rest of your money and playing with it. So that brings me up because I want people to see, because a lot of people come in here, they're they're crushing it in real estate. We're in GoBundant together. It's predominantly real estate people in there and focus on acquisitions and all that. What's your thought process around investing in limited partnerships, whether it's syndications or whatnot, why go that path and pick your own? Because there's value in that. Yeah. Um, so Joe, I, I think the reality is I'm, I'm not an expert at real estate, right? I'm an expert at law. I'm an expert at client acquisition and at running cases. And if I were to come and pick my own piece of property and try to manage it or or hire somebody to try to manage it or do you know do a rehab or whatever then i'm competing against guys that actually know what they're doing right yeah. <laughs> and yes everybody started somewhere everybody started from someplace where they didn't know what they were doing um, but for me that my the best use of my next dollar and my next hour really is in my law practice and so what i try to do now in 2023 is find um, syndication partners who are running deals, who have a track record of, of being hitting singles and doubles, right? I'm not looking for home runs in any of these deals. If you yeah. get if my game, my goal is to be in the game for long enough with singles and doubles that some of them turn into home runs. Um, and so really that's, that's the been a side benefit to me of GoBundance has been exposure to all of these guys who are really smart, who are running sophisticated syndications who I can just put some money with, right? Are, are there, are there faster ways to get wealthy in real estate? Yes. Um, but it's not my path. Yeah. And I love that, <clears throat> that thought process. Cause as you shared everything, it's like you build it, you built your business to the point where you're a master and you're going to stay in your lane, which so many people, they like to jump around. Right. And like, that's like a tree. If you pick up a tree every six months to move it, it's never going to bear the fruit or as much fruit as you possibly can, as if you just planted the tree and left it there. Right. And so that was, that was really hard for me in my first six months in abundance. Like there's so many, so many little micro tribe calls to go to. And so uh, you could do triple net leases or you could do uh, house hacking, or you could do co-living or you could do and I, like, wow, I could get good at all of this stuff. Um, but if you try to get good at all of it, you're not going to be good at any of it. And so staying in my lane and just finding somebody else to invest with is is my philosophy, right? At least for now. Oh, no, it's powerful because you're a master in it. 
right? And versus going back to being a beginner, right? And, that, mm. and I've done that, right? Master level coach. And then I was like, all right, I want to also learn real estate because I want to teach my boys. So then I had to go back and become a novice in real estate and start learning and educating myself over the last few years. I'm by no means a master at it, but it, it took me I had to get my coaching business to a point where I could do that. And then, hey, going back to being a beginner again, it's like going to boot camp for the first time. It's like, ah, right. But yeah. I love what you're doing because yeah. I know so many people, friends of mine, that they're LP and deals and they have financial freedom from doing that, from getting that mailbox money. So for those of you that love what you do, you're mastering your business, but you just haven't systematized it like Brian has. Well, that's your focus right? Systematize your business where you, you don't have to be in it all the time, maximize your revenue, and then throw it into an LP position where you can have that mailbox money. And over time, it builds up enough where you're just financially free. It pays, you get more passive income than your bills, right? So I love that thought process. And it is different than what a lot of people who've come on the show there, you know, they, they may have shifted or they are full-time in real estate where, you know, your lane and like, you're not deviating from that. And that's, I think that's your superpower and that's, what's going to, and on top of that, you have an incredible life. It sounds like the lifestyle you guys have and the life that you have, it's like, you know, so. Yeah. It's, it's been a fun, a fun year. You know, we've uh, probably every month this year, I've been out of the office for a week traveling with the family or traveling to go abundance events or, or other conferences. Um, and it's, it's funny because now I feel like I'm more busy than ever because I've compressed the work that I used to do in four weeks into three and then, and then the travel. So, um, but I'm focusing really on stuff that I enjoy for the most part. Uh, and so I've made a real habit of taking, taking all of the tasks in, in the firm and splitting them between, I call it heavy, medium and light. Right. Um, I spent maybe a week or two weeks writing it on it. Every time I did something, I got sorted into one of those columns and then figuring out how do I offload the stuff that felt heavy to me or medium to me to somebody else so that I can focus exclusively on the things that are really easy for me to do um, and hard for other people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's where you make all your money. It's not the thing that's easy for you to do, right? Because anybody can lay on the couch uh, and watch TV, but it's the thing that feels easy to you that's really hard to everybody else. Yeah, no, that's key. I bet you teach on your mastermind, don't you? Yeah, you bet. You guys are getting free nuggets that are watching today. So no, but you still need to join as mastermind if you're a lawyer. So anyway, um, very cool. So, but you're not out of real estate completely, right? Like you guys have, you shared that you have a Airbnb. Tell us a little mm -hmm. bit more about that and the thought process there um, for you and your family. Yeah. So, so God, I'm an accidental real estate investor. Um, so we bought this Airbnb. It's in Ocean City, Maryland, which is about three hours from me without traffic. And it's a four bedroom townhouse directly on the beach. It's got a backyard, which is unique to that area. Most of that area is high rises. Um, but I was talking to a guy who used to be a lifeguard up there that he told me that he called the six blocks, six block area where we live, he called it the desert. He didn't like the lifeguard there because nothing ever happens there. Mm. Um, so it's a, a four bedroom. It's got a, a backyard that backs up to the dunes and it's right on the beach. And I say that I'm an accidental investor because I had no idea when I bought this thing and started managing it myself that I could do a cost segregation analysis, depreciate it and write it off against my W-2 income and not pay taxes in the year that we bought the house. No idea about any of that. I had no idea that this is a special location in Ocean City. And, and I had some vague idea that this thing would cash flow, but... Um, but not nearly as much as it has. So, you know, we we bought it to have a place to go with our family effectively for free. Yeah. And it pays for itself. Spits if it spits off a little bit of money, we're happy. Uh, it generates about ten or twelve thousand dollars in in revenue that I can strip out and go invest somewhere else every year. That's awesome. For those of you that don't know what a cost seg is, a cost segregation, all that is is saying, hey, the amount of time that you could take to depreciate it, you condense it into one or two years. Usually people do it in one year. And then all of a sudden, say you get a hundred thousand dollars and you made 150 grand, well, you only have to pay taxes on fifty thousand. And if you have a business, you have more expenses, so you might not pay any taxes at all. But that's yeah. awesome. And it, I love that because we're, we have the same thing for our family. We have a house in the mountains for the winter time and the summer. It's always booked just like yours. And so, but what's cool about that is, and I love that you're just an accidental real estate investor, 
Uh, but what I love is like your kids, when you guys know you're going out there, they know what to expect, right? Like they know yeah. what they're getting into, which I love that for my boys. Cause they're like, Hey, when are we going up to our cabin? Right. They know what's out there, the playground, the jacuzzi, right. The snow and just so much that we can do up there. So they love that. So that's awesome. I, with, if my wife watches this interview, she's going to be a little bit jealous because she's more of a beach person than a snow person. <laughs> so well, you guys are living in the wrong spot for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we, so we, that's why we do a lot of travel. So, <laughs> but that's awesome. Um, <clears throat> all right. So you, you have, you run a business, you have children, you have, you have their schedules. You're not just competing against yours, but you have to compete yeah. against their schedule. How do you manage your work and their schedule and your relationship with your wife? How do you manage that as a business owner? Because I know that's the biggest challenge that a yeah. lot of business owners face. I'll start with the relationship with my wife. So, you, you know, again, complete by accident, but she started to come work for us within the last year. So she was, uh, she's in HR. She was working at an IT startup that grew from 16 people to 80 and they got acquired. I think it, 20, 2020 or 2021 by some 800 person behemoth. And all of a sudden her life where she knew everybody at the company just went to shit because she didn't know anybody. They were across three different payroll systems. You know, ev everybody's just emailing the, the lady in HR who can solve all the problems instead of actually having a face to the name. So that quickly became really miserable for her. Luckily she had a, um, a package that vested that we were able to renegotiate to get her out of there a little bit early. And then she came to start working for us. So one of the big unlocks that we've had has been, you know, Joe, by, we get to the end of the night with our kids, put them in bed seven, seven 30, and we're exhausted from work and from sports and from managing the emotions of the three young boys. And, and we were having a really hard time then connecting at seven, seven thirty, eight o'clock, right? You would rather just lay down on the on the couch and, and do nothing. Um, but then when she came to work for us, we've, we've started to create the freedom where we can now go to lunch together. We can connect during the middle of the day. We can problem solve then. We can kind of do all, do all of this planning that many couples do at night or don't do at all. We can do it in the middle of the day. So that has been really, really helpful for us. You know, how do we balance everything else? I, I don't know, man. Um, you know, we got a big calendar. <laughs> we, try, we try to chunk in the family vacations and and that and sports season first, and then fill everything else in around that. The other thing that, that we got really good at in the last two years has been traveling alone, um, has been not, you know, the commitment to everywhere that I go with my friends, you need to come to. And she's got a group of friends from college that gets together a couple times a year. And and during the beginning part of our relationship, it was all the couples would go. And now it's like, are you going on the girls trip? I'll stay here with the boys. I'll go on the boys trip. You stay here with the kids. And then we'll go on our trips. So our sequence really has been like one for her, one for me, one for us. Um, and that has given us bandwidth outside of the outside of the day to day running of the house um, and freed us up really to, I think, to be a whole lot happier. That's awesome. You you dropped a couple of great nuggets in there. One being, if you guys didn't catch it, was like you plan your trips and your vacations and then everything else goes around that, <clears throat> which is awesome. It's usually the other way around. We plan business or work and then mm -hmm. whenever we can fit in, you know, slow season or whatnot, then we'll go on our trip. Mm -hmm. That's not life by design, right? So I, I absolutely love that. My wife and I, we do that same thing too. The other thing is that you hit on, and as you said, if they do it at all, and that was calendar planning. For a lot of people, they'll plan their business, but they don't sit down and calculate their life and plan their life. How are we getting to that next level? What are we doing as a family? What's that next level look like? Mm -hmm. What do we got to do this week? What did the boys got this week, right? And and that and it, with a lack of clarity comes uncertainty or chaos and all the emotions with that. It's easy for a relationship to like butt heads. So I love that you guys work together, which isn't always, people aren't always fortunate enough to do that. But yeah. you guys do, and you take advantage of the times that you guys got together. So, absolutely love, love, love that. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you, I, I got that 
year long planning idea from Jesse Itzler. I did his calendar club one year. He sends you this big calendar, 365 days, all in one big fold out poster board. And, and I said, well, let's just take some sticky notes and like put on where we want to go. Like before we plan anything else, before we plan any conferences, before, you know, I have to schedule any trials, like let's chunk in for ourselves what we want to do. And then we've worked we've scaled up from that. Now we're creating this travel bucket list with our kids who, you know, in what's, so I got the five-year-olds, the youngest in 13 years, I won't have any kids at home. That's the plan at least. Right. right. And so, so, okay, we got 13 summers of travel with them. Let's figure out where are all the places that we want to go with them before they're out of the house. And then maybe what age makes the most sense where we can take them and, and we can all get something out of it. So kind of, uh, it's not reverse engineering, I guess, but figuring out what's the bucket list and then what's the best place to put all of those things. That is awesome. I love that. And, it, and just a thought process of like, hey, we have with our youngest, you have less with your oldest, right? It's like mm -hmm. 13 summers and less with the countdown on. It's like, what do you want to do with them? And do you guys get buy in with them on like, kind of like, do they get to say, hey, dad, I want to go here or why or Europe? Yeah, my the. Um, you have to give it to them as an assignment, right? You, my kids are not the kind that like, if we're sitting around the dinner table and you say, where do you want to go? They're going to think of anything. But if I said to them, go to YouTube and spend two hours <laughs> and come back with a list of bucket list places that you want to come, they they'll do it that way. So that's the buy-in. And, and, you know, at this point it's still, okay, here's where we're going. Like we're going on a, on a cruise next spring break. Well, here's where we're stopping. Why don't you guys do a little bit of research on the cruise ports and you figure out what excursions you want to go on, right? Oh, so, awesome. um, so yeah, to, the, to that extent, we get buy-in on them. Um, they probably would tell us they just want to go to Mr. Beast's house you know, <laughs> <laughs> if, if we let them plan everything. Um, but we're awesome. starting small. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, maybe you do need to hit his house, but I love the <laughs> fact that you guys actually sit down around the dinner table. Let me know your secret because my boys, they're up and at it. They don't sit. sit so. Oh yeah. No, we, that's a, that's a big thing for us. Every, every night when we're home, <laughs> we don't have soccer. It's dinner. Dinner is a family together. Yeah. Well, I mean, when we have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, well, my son's mm -hmm. three or yeah, three in two days as we're recording this. So yeah. it's a little bit harder than versus 10, eight and five. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I love that you guys actually give them that assignment, right? Like go look and see what we can do when we're there. So it's like they, you're still giving them the ability to make, make a family decision, right? And that's mm -hmm. empowering for them. And so you guys are empowering them to learn how to make decisions because I've coached people that are still afraid to make decisions, right? And that that limits their ability to grow and the, the ability to rapidly grow or accelerate where they want to go. And so yeah. I love that you guys are instilling that into them now. That's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, God, yeah, it's left me. Go on, go on. Whatever I was thinking of just left me real fast. <laughs> All good. All good. Um, so real quick, I just want to touch on your mastermind. I mean, yeah. I know, I know there's a lot, we're in a mastermind, you run a mastermind, I'm going to be starting a mastermind probably at the beginning of 2024. Um, but why is a mastermind important in, for you? And then talk about someone in your, in your mastermind that you felt like has the best success story, because that always breeds faith and hope and belief in the people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, throw us out that and then we'll, uh, we'll transition. Yeah. I mean, I, I, so I think the big secret to masterminds is that, you know, you come seeking one solution and what you leave with is a solution to a problem you didn't even know you have. Um, so again, back to my cross-segregation, accidental real estate investment thing, my very first go abundance meetup, I, I said to somebody, oh, we just bought this house. And here, I forget what the problem I thought I had was. He's like, no, you got a, another problem. I was like, you paid way too much in taxes. And here's this trick that'll prevent you from having to do that. And so that happens all the time. There's, we have a guy um, in, in Manhattan, he's an injury lawyer in Manhattan. Nobody's going to Manhattan anymore because it's super dangerous. And he's got a, um, uh, he's got a, an office space. He doesn't know what to do with. And, you know, he's like, what do I, do I let it go? I, I really like for Google, my business purposes, having the physical location, uh, in Manhattan, but I don't know. And somebody said, well, why don't you just go to your landlord and try to renegotiate the rent? Because 
you're not the only one that doesn't want to have office space in Manhattan. So of course he did. And he saved himself like $60,000 in rent payments over the course of the next year, just by asking that question. And so to me, it's, it's the power of, uh, our, so we run ours as a hot seat. There's 20 lawyers, 20 law firms in each group. And once a quarter, they come to our office in Fairfax from all over the country and you get 30 to 45 minutes to present what's going really well for you. What are you having a problem with? And what's the one thing that if you solved it before you got back to your office would like change your next quarter. Right. And, and the thing is that we, as lawyers, we have a hard time sharing with anybody who's in our industry, what our problems are, anybody in the industry, in your area. So if you put together a group of injury lawyers from Northern Virginia, none of them would share their best secrets. But if you bring together lawyers from all over the country who aren't competing with each other, yeah. all of a sudden it's like, here's my SEO vendor. Here's, here's my CPA. Uh, here's the outsourced agency that I use to hire my VA who now does all of our intakes. And, and now you've got all these resources that you can bring together, especially on a nationalized basis, and really move your practice forward. So that's the benefit of it is having people who, who are not your competitors, who are willing to be vulnerable and authentic uh, yeah. in the room and ask for help and, and give help. That's awesome. I love that. Just one question saved them $60,000, right? And it's like, if and not everyone's in that situation, but look, even if you paid like 25 grand to be in it for a year, he just made his money times mm -hmm. two and a half almost. Right. Yeah. Like, and that's not to talk about any other added benefits or, you know, referral sources or strategies or whatever. Right. Like that's yeah. such a huge win. That's why I like the mastermind thing. Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill, right. Talks about the power of the mastermind, the collective consciousness and how two or more brains come together. Right. Like we just create so much more hot seats are unbelievable. I've ran many of them and it's just, it is impactful. The problem is for most people, they don't, they won't do that with their friends not even their network, right? And so they sit there and they're like, man, do I want to invest this large sum of money into a mastermind? Mm -hmm. But it's like, how can you afford not to, right? Mm -hmm. because of the people, the connections, the resources, the questions, the value that you get. And so I know yours is specifically niche. So anyone that's interested, uh, you know, that's a, a, an attorney or knows an attorney, you may want to refer to them. We'll get that information here in a moment. But if you're not, and you're looking, you have a goal, like, find a mastermind that uh, that aligns with what you're looking to achieve, right? Like if you're looking to achieve to be the best, it's, you know, I don't know, in real estate, there's tons of masterminds, Go Abundance one of them, but, you know, there's so many more that you could get around. Now, the one thing I, I, would, I would say, and you can correct me on how you feel, Brian, but I, the one thing I'm not 100% sold on with Go Abundance is that it's so large. It is I large. I want the intimacy. I want to know everyone. And I want yeah. to be able to add value, not just receive value. And with like abundance where you're pushing almost a thousand members, it's hard to do that. But if you're yeah. in a mastermind, another 50, that is amazing. So Pat, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. So, so it's interesting. Um, we had a consultant come in earlier this year about the mastermind business. And, and his idea was, uh, so I, I told you we have 20 firms in two different groups. One group is trying to go over a million dollars in revenue. The other is already doing a million dollars in revenue. We're Re really trying to self-actualize, which is interesting. Like, it's, okay, now that you have a fully operational business, how does the lawyer get to work on the stuff only that he wants to work on and and then get to help his staff to grow in, and personally develop? So that's kind of a cool space. But we so call it 40 members between those two groups. And the guy that came in was like, well, there's no reason that you guys couldn't be 200 members. And I'm like, okay, maybe, but it'd be a very different vibe, right? Yeah. Um, it, it would be not in my office in Fairfax where, where we have kind of a purpose-built studio that'll sit about 50 people. Um, it would be, again, back to running out hotel spaces, um, probably sitting people classroom style and bringing in speakers. And there's a place for that. And we put on a, a summit every year. It's going to be in Orlando this year where we bring 250, 300 lawyers in. Um, but it's not a mastermind. And mm -hmm. so I think what Gabundance has done really well is it's the ethos is uh, is large. 
And there's a bunch of little pockets and you can be in a number of micro tribe pockets or your, your GoPod pocket. And you can create intimacy in those groups. But I agree with you that, you know, I'm, I'm glad that they decided to cap it at wherever it is, eight, 800 or so and institute a waiting list because I, I felt very much the same way that it's growing and growing and growing and you lose the connection with any individual members. You know, somebody might quit and you wouldn't notice. Yeah. Um, and, and then there's got to be a screening function to any good mastermind. Really what you're paying for is the other people in the room. You're really not paying for the guru who sits at the front of the room and directs traffic. You're paying for who am I, who is vetted and, and curated the people that are going to be in the room with me because they're the ones that are going to give you the best ideas. And so, yeah, I, I do think keeping them small is important. Absolutely. And, and there's other people who go against that theory, right? Like the more the merrier and, you know, there's more to pull from and I'm totally... Yeah on board for that no right or wrong it's just that's the philosophy i've subscribed to i want the intimacy around that and so i love what you guys are doing keeping yours small and intimate um where you could probably grow right to the point where you want right um and even maybe if there's a i don't know how if you do pay for the year or you know yeah. monthly revenue it's like you could create another passive income stream and so anyway yeah I, do you want to share on I'd that? Need, I'd need an I'd need an eighth day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. But that goes back to life by design. Like, how are you designing your life? Some people exactly just want more money and money and money. And, and I was doing another interview today, and it was like we were talking about how money's just a tool. And I used mm -hmm. to not see it as a tool. I used to see it as the end goal. Like, the more I can have, the better it was for me. And one, one of the shifts I had to make is, now, don't get me wrong, you have to put your oxygen mask on first. We all know that. But once you have your mask on and you have your needs met and your lifestyle, it's like, what are you doing to give back? And money's a tool to do that, right? To give mm -hmm. value, make impact. And I started, I remember, and we'll wrap up here in a moment, but I remember there was a time where... <clears throat> I was questioning my path and I was like, all right, well, let me think about this. Like, <clears throat> let's say I have, I, I hit the lottery and I have $150 million in my account, right? I go, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to the nicest resorts, going to eat the nicest food, do the fun mm -hmm. things, buy the toys. And after about six months to a year of doing that, I'm going to find, and I'll end up being bored. So what would I do at that point? And I was like, well, what I'd want to do is I want people to experience what I experienced and I'd want to help them now. Yeah. If I won the lottery, I can't help them win the lottery, but the tools and the knowledge and the resources and connections I have, what if I was to, you know, be able to help people achieve that level of success that they want. And I was like, that's amazing. And I was like, well, why don't I do that now? <laughs> All right. And so I, I, yeah, I love that. So that's kind of how I, I, and other things fall in place, but that's, that's my mindset around it. So Anyway, masterminds are a great place to do that. Um, where's all right? We'll go in. We're going to shift into as we wrap up some mastermind or excuse me, some rapid fire questions. But sure. before I ask that one, is where do you what do you have on the calendar for you and the family next? That's like everyone's looking forward to going to. Uh, that ev well, everyone's not coming on this one, but my wife and I are going to Greece in November. Uh, with the GoBundance Spartan race team, we're running a Spartan race in Sparta. So that'll be pretty cool. Uh, my in-laws are going to come and watch the kids for, for a couple of days. Um, let's see. We have our our summit is in Orlando in October. And then we're figuring out December. We're, you know, we're figuring out, okay, do we want to just take a pause and maybe go up to the beach house and, and chill? Or do we want to go somewhere? Um, and then the big trip is spring break. We're taking a cruise down to the uh, to the Caribbean with the kids. Uh, it must be awesome. I've never been to the Caribbean, even though I grew up on the East Coast. So, yeah. Well, that'll be fun for sure. Yeah. But here's what's great is you guys have created the life where you have options. And I think that's what most people are when we talk, you know, here on Master Life by Design. The goal is to help you create financial freedom because it's not the end destination, it's actually the starting point. And what we want to make sure is that you have options. And if you have options, you can be able to inspire and impact other people. And most people that have a small business or a very lucrative nine to five, they don't have that ability because they're so busy in what they're doing. And so we want to shift and sh change that. And that's why I love having people like yourself on here. So appreciate you. Um, yeah, let, me, let me just, let me if you don't mind, let me touch on that for a minute. So, so I, I kind of went down the personal finance rabbit hole like three or four years ago. 
And the first thing that is that most people discover as you get out of like Dave Ramsey is this just financial independence, retire early movement, right? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, if I can just get a big enough bag of money and then bleed it at three or 4% every year, then I can, I can retire and, and okay, what do I have to do then to be able to achieve that by 35 or 38 or four or whatever number it is. Right. Um, but, but as I kind of went down that line, I was like, well, but then what would I do? <laughs> you know, Like, I, I think you, you need that mental stimulation and you need problems to solve. And so I focused less on how do I accumulate and how do I create passive income and, and more on how do I create the life that I actually enjoy and, and the, the practice that I like going to work at, right? Most people hate Sunday night because they hate Monday morning. Um, but how, what if instead of trying to have a big enough pile, you focus exclusively on creating a Monday that you didn't hate and a Friday that you didn't have to celebrate, right? Ooh, what a nugget. What a nugget. That is amazing. Yeah. Most people don't think like that though. You know, that's a problem. No, it's, and, and, and then, and, and, you know, to your point, I started with your point about options, like to your point about options, if you reach the point where you don't like doing this anymore, now you've created this side income stream where you can quit, where you can sell the business, where you can go do something else. I was, I was talking to a lawyer at a convention two weeks ago, he's 55 and his firm is doing, you know, probably three times the amount of money that my firm is doing, but he's like, I've never met a dollar. I don't like spending. And so I have to keep working. Well, that, that sucks, man. <laughs> I would like to be to a place where when I'm 55, I'm only doing what I want to do and I can quit if I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. Yes. So good. And that, yeah. again, most people don't think about that. And like right there, you just ask a question and that's why there's a shameless plug. That's why coaching so powerful is when yeah. you get questions like that, it causes you to think differently. Think about things that you thought about, but then also things you haven't thought about. And that's so powerful. And you're right. What if you didn't like having, you know, Monday that you didn't like going to and a Friday you didn't celebrate? I love that question. And that's powerful. Ah, so good. All right. Yeah, man. Well, let's talk about real quick. Um, what's one book that made an impact on you and in your life that you recommend to people and it can't be rich dad, poor dad, or yeah. <laughs> I, I heard you, I, I listened to your interview with Sam Weger uh, this morning. So I heard, and I'm ready for this question. Uh, I'll give you two. Um, one, the personal development book is vivid vision, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the, the left turn book is born to run by Christopher McDougall. So I, I was hammering away at road marathons for a while. And I read this book, which is, are you familiar with it? I I'm not. So born born to run is the story of the Terra Umera Indians, oh, which yeah, are like this ultra marathon running tribe in Mexico. It will blow your mind the way that evolution has designed the human body and and the ligaments in the back of your neck so that you can run and your head doesn't bounce everywhere. Um, it's it's crazy. I think you'd like it. I, I've, I actually, now I think about it, I did, and you're not even supposed to wear shoes. And they talk about how some of the mm -hmm. shoes have just actually destroyed our posture, right? And yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, so good. I actually started, I used to throw my old shoes away after like a year or two. And now I'm like, no, I want them to wear down. Like yeah. it slowly gets me back to my natural. Anyway, yes, very good book. Good call. And you ran ultra marathons, uh, you said. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, What's one piece of wisdom that you would give someone if they were just starting their journey, let's say at 18? Hmm. That really made an impact. Oh, yeah, geez. at 18. Um, so so I think, and you, you mentioned Napoleon Hill earlier uh, in this discussion, but you know, you're the average of the five people that you spend the most time around, right? And and there's a couple ways to get access to better people. Number one is to buy your way into a mastermind like you run and like I run. But number two is to be the hub, right? So I, I have this, this phrase, be the hub, like just invite five smart people over and invite 10, right? Cause only five are going to come, yeah. um, start a, a study group. If you're in school and say, you, you know, you have to have a a minus average to be in the group. Guess what? Nobody's going to look at your report card, right? Um, be the one who's, who's interesting enough and interested enough to attract those people to you and see what happens with your life. That is so good. That is really good. I hope you guys got that. That's powerful. Um, okay. And 
last question i'm trying to think which one do i want to go <laughs> with there they're all there's so many good ones um if you weren't this is just a fun question for you yeah. If you didn't choose to go down the law mm. firm path, what would you do differently? What would you choose? What would I be doing? I have no idea, man. Um, you know, I, I had this, this idea that I would like to be a high school teacher, like either history or some or business. But I think honestly, given my level of patience, I would love to teach one period of high school and then go home. I don't know that I could do it all day. Um, but I, I like teaching. My, my gift really is simplifying complex ideas into into simple ideas, uh, which is why I'm, I'm a reasonably good trial lawyer, um, explaining medicine to juries. But I, I think I would like, I think I would enjoy on a short term basis, <laughs> 90 minutes a day teaching like high school something. Well, I'm sure you, if you networked with one of those five people, you could actually get your way in there to do such a thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I like that. And um, teaching, that's, I, I always tell people, I don't, coaching is not my number one. Like I only do it exclusive, uh, exclusively, but teaching is my number one. That's why hmm. I have this YouTube channel, right? Like I love teaching. And so, uh, do you have a YouTube channel? I don't, I don't. Maybe you need to start one just to teach the greatness that's within you, man. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, we'll see. Let's we'll say uh, on day number nine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, does it fit into my lifestyle? Maybe not, but yeah. um, hey, Brian, I really appreciate you taking time. I love the perspective. I love the mastery, knowing your lane, all the nuggets that you dropped today. Very valuable for everyone that's listening. So thank you for being on the show. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, that's it for today's episode of the Millionaire Series. My name is Joe Mavu with Master Life by Design. Make sure that you comment below what's one big nugget you took away. Give it a thumbs up. And most importantly, hit subscribe and that notification button when you know that we have more interviews coming out, you can be notified. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. Other than that, again, Brian, thank you for being on the show. Everyone, look forward to seeing you on the next one. Again, I'm Joe Moffitt with Master Life by Design. Have a great one. See ya.